powers, three doses, and beta metasone. Uh, 12 milligram intramuscularly every 24 hours, uh, only two doses. And uh, keep in mind, it's very important to give this uh, drug timely. So to get the optimal benefit, uh, it has to be when the delivery occurs 24, 24 hours after completing therapy. So that is very important. There's no point in giving just one dose just before the delivery. So if you anticipate a preterm delivery, this is it's your duty to make sure um, mothers uh, to get this uh, important drug at correct time. So the second um, antenatal intervention is a prophylactic antibiotics to mother. You all must be well aware that uh, antibiotics to the, uh, we have to give antibiotics to the mother in, uh, in the cases of premature rupture of membranes, if it is more than 18 hours, it has been shown that it prevents early onset of sepsis in newborn. This is very important, especially in uh, premature deliveries when the membranes rupture early. So drugs used are the erythromycin orally or the ampicillin or the cefuroxime. I think it depends on the unit protocol. So if you uh, assume uh, um, um, duty as a house officer in the obstetric units, you should know what is the unit protocol before giving these drugs. You have to consult with your consultant and stick into a one protocol. So in Sri Lanka, you know, more than 90% of births hmm, attended by skilled uh, healthcare workers. That means our midwives, nurses, and doctors will train. And we have uh, only very small number of home deliveries. So this is a great achievement and we need to take advantage of this. So as a house officers, now uh, when you are uh, working in the uh, obstetric ward or pediatric wards, so it's very important uh, you prepare for a delivery. So uh, one important intervention, you have to make sure that if you are going to deliver the baby in the warm environment, at least the room temperature has to be 25 centigrades. To get this, you have to uh, off air conditioners, fans, and shut windows. And if there's a warmer, you can keep that warmer on. And even other th things are basics, you must be knowing, you have to get ready with the mother's clothes. So hand washing is very, very important. And you have to wear double pairs of gloves uh, and warm towels, and you check the registration equipment. And uh, uh, important to start the clock with the delivery of the baby. Now, I do not uh, go into details of the, the, this uh, hand washing techniques. You must be well aware about nowadays because of the pandemic, even the school children and lay people know how, how to do this. So, I mean, if you do not have time to uh, do hand washing, alcohol-based hand rub has shown uh, it's very effective where the, uh, it can kill bacteria up to about 99%. And it, the duration lasts for about 180 minutes. So before touching anybody, so uh, using the hand rub, uh, using the tech, correct technique for 20 seconds is very important. So the practices have had delivery recently, um, it has been changed. So most of the hospitals now allow to keep the companion of choice. And it has been shown that it reduces the need for anergesia to the mother as well as uh, reduce the morbidity. So uh, this is very important. So this companion always has to be a, the husband, uh, either the uh, mother or the sister or the close friend of the uh, uh, mother, you can allow them to stay. So I want to discuss um, in uh, one intervention, which is very important in details, uh, that is the prevention of hypothermia here at birth. Now, you know, this uh, babies at birth is quite different by because they are born naked and they are bathed with the amniotic fluids. So we have seen this picture earlier also in your lectures, but just to reiterate. So the this baby is uh, we lose heat from the body by all four these uh, mechanisms. So because of baby's wet, uh, by evaporation, the large amount of heat, the baby is going to lose unless you take the adequate measures to prevent this. And if you keep the baby on the cold surface, baby will lose some of it by conduction. And if you keep the baby in front of a fan or a window, baby will lose 
um, heat by convection. And because of the large surface area of the head compared to the body, baby will lose some more heat by radiation. So uh, it's very important to take all the measures that we are going to discuss to prevent heat loss from the body by all formic cancers. So because why we are worrying about hypothermia? Hypothermia in the newborn causes adverse outcomes. It has shown that it increases the mobility and morbidity. So we expect them to keep the body temperature. Expected temperature is 36.5 to 37.5 centigrade. So um, just to reiterate the definition and degrees of hypothermia, normal range is 36.5 to 37.5. And we say that now the uh, starting point is the cold states if the temperature is between 36.5 to 36. This is the time that you have to do something, cause for concern, and moderate hypothermia between 36 to 30. 32 centigrade. We say the severe hypothermia less than 32. If the severe hypothermia is increased very high mortality and outlook would be grave. Now, <clears throat> WHO has uh, defined 10 steps that you have to um, take at birth. So um, 10 step, one is to call out the time of birth, you know, due to the uh, cultural context. It's very important birth time, even in our country, the mothers want to know exact time of birth of the baby. You know, uh, because of this uh, time, they decide when to go to school and, you know, to sit for the exam and to um, uh, marriage, all these uh, things decide by the, this uh, birth time. So if somebody has to um, call loud out the time of birth at the time of delivery. So um, the second step, they have defined the clamp and cut the cord. They have given the standards two to five centimeters from the baby's abdomen. That is the standard depth that you have to keep. And dry baby with a warm, clean travel or piece of cloth and white pies. Why this is important? Because to minimize the heat loss by um, evaporation. So, you know, I mean, if you try to uh, wipe the baby with a uh, towel in a preterm baby, less than 32 weeks, you know, they have a very delicate uh, skin. So you should not do that. Thing. What you can do is you can slip the baby into a bag, into a polythene bag up to the level of neck. So, um, and at the same time, you have to assess the baby's breathing while drying. So you check the color of the baby, tone, uh, heart rate and breathing. So you can sort of... Uh, uh, feel the pulsation of the cord and count the heart rate. So next step is to deliver the baby onto mother's abdomen after the cord clamping. Why this is being done? Because if you keep the baby on the cold surface in the labor room, say the very cold trolley, uh, there will be uh, heat loss by uh, conduction. So to minimize, so keep the baby on the uh, mother's abdomen. So because mother's temperature is about 37 maybe, so there won't be any heat loss by conduction. And cover the mother and baby with warm cloth. That is to again to minimize the heat loss by uh, convection. Uh, the seventh step is the baby remains between the mother's breast, skin to skin contact. So keeping the baby and the skin to skin contact in between mother's breast has a lot of advantages. I think in the I mean, next couple of uh, lectures, we will get uh, the reason. And put a hat on the baby's head, that is the eighth step, that is to prevent uh, uh, heat loss by radiation. And it's very important to place an identity label on the baby at the same time, because in a busy labor rooms, um, uh, several babies um, we born at the same time, so there can be mixing up to prevent that. Um, so it's very important, you have to supervise that, um, otherwise if there's something happen, so, I mean, you all have to go to the courts and give evidence and a lot of problems. So, it's uh, your duty and your responsibility uh, to overlook this uh, process. And the 10th step is to encourage first breastfeed within one hour of birth. I think there's a separate lecture to talk about this. I don't want to talk in detail. So, uh, now the other important uh, intervention is delayed cord clamping. It is something started recently and uh, so you have to delay in um, clamping cord at least for five, one minute. Especially this is very important during trans uh, in preterm babies because during this transitional circulation to establish well, so it will sort of allow more blood volume to go to the baby's side. So to happen this, you have to hold 
at or below the placental level. So uh, we allow, we wait for about one minute without clamping. So more blood volume will go to the towards the baby if you hold at, at least at the placental level. But make sure the baby does not uh, require visitation. You can see when the baby is, uh, uh, is crying and breathing and the tone is okay while uh, coming out. But if you see the baby who is very flat and not breathing, you should not wait uh, for delayed coat. Clamping. So, a lot of advantages for term and preterm babies. So, the preterm babies it had been shown, it reduced, I mean, it improved the uh, circulation soon after birth and it reduces, uh, increase um, more um, uh, blood volume and pap cells and it reduced the interventricular incidence of interventricular hemorrhages and um, uh, number of blood transfusions that baby will need during the stay in the ICU. So immediate skin to skin contact for one hour after birth is very, very important. This picture shows that how to keep the baby in between the, uh, the breast. Mm -hmm. So the baby's uh, uh, skin will um, contact with the mother's skin, which has been shown. It, I mean, obviously it will prevent hypothermia because the mother's uh, skin is very warm, around say 37 centigrade, and it um, increases the bonding between the mother and the baby. And most importantly, the baby will be colonized with the maternal friendly flora. If you keep this baby on the surface in the labor room, uh, you know, the trolley or the warmer, which is sort of contaminated with multi resistant organism, baby's immune system will be stimulated with these organisms first because baby was inside in a sterile uh, sac. So after coming, it's uh, always good to colonize with the maternal friendly flora. So establishing breastfeeding is very important. This is how to keep. Now the baby will automatically latch into the, or somebody has to support for latching into the breast. I think there's another separate lecture for you all to deal with and importance of establishing the breastfeeding soon after birth. So the, when you talk about the cord care, I told you that the, you have to cut the cord uh, with uh, two, two centimeters from the baby's abdomen. And after cutting, you observe for oozing, don't just um, leave the baby. If there's a blood oozes, place a second tie between the skin and the first tie. But don't put a, uh, anything on the stump, no metadine, no surgical fluid, just sort of clip it dry and leave the stump uncovered. And I mean, you can, at the same time, it's important for you to observe the number of umbilical arteries. So the other intervention that you must be knowing is vitamin K administration. And routinely we administered uh, it intramuscularly using a one ml syringe with a 23 gauge needle and uh, which has been shown that prevent the hemorrhagic disease of newborn. Dose is one milligram for a term baby and 0.5 milligram for a preterm baby. So the other parameters after doing everything, when the, after keeping the baby on, on the mother's bed for about one hour after breastfeeding, you can sort of uh, do other, uh, uh, checking these parameters of weight uh, and uh, checking the OFC and the length at birth, which is important, but this is usually be done by the mammid wives and you all have to, uh, overlook and supervise whether they are doing it the proper way. So before transferring to the postnatal ward, dress and wrap in soft dry cloth, cover head with cap just to again to prevent, to take the, all the measure, possible measures to prevent hypothermia in this baby. Why the, if the baby become hypothermic, that will reduce us the whatever the baby is secreting natural surfactant and thereby baby will develop grunting and tachypnea to maintain the alveoli open and also it will reduce, uh, it uh, causes hypoglycemia in the baby and the acidosis there by all the organs going to get affected. So that is why you have to pay uh, full attention to uh, minimize the hypothermia at birth. So after that, you uh, medical officer uh, from the pediatric board or the uh, PBU has to do the full neonatal examination. There will be a separate lecture uh, of uh, how to do the neonatal examination, I think. So vitamin A K prophylaxis, and when you are transferring from the labor room to the uh, ward, again, you can keep the uh, baby on between the uh, breast, uh, keeping the skin to skin contact. And on admission to the ward, it's important to uh, check the baby's temperature, maybe sort of a baby has become uh, hypothermic again. So again, in the postnatal ward, you have to maintain the room temperature more than 25. So avoid bathing for about 24 hours, and it's very important for you to, I mean, advise a mother. Uh, no need to sort of check the temperature by the thermometer, but if you advise a mother uh, to uh, touch and see the, the temperature, uh, feel the temperature of the baby's uh, 
you know, feet every four hours by touching. So prevention of uh, hypothermia. So tooming in is very important. Don't uh, try to um, uh, separate the mother and baby unless there's a absolute um, indication. So bathe in the baby. If you want to bathe the baby, warm room. Uh, you need a warm room and warm water, and you have to dry quickly and thoroughly. And breast after that, you have to breast warmly and wrap and give the mother to breastfeeding. So the breastfeeding itself uh, increases the temperature in the baby. Um, so if uh, by any chance, if the baby has become hypothermic. So uh, bathing the baby, uh, the small or low birth uh, babies, I think it's not um, discourage um, bathing, uh, at least to, uh, until the baby's weight uh, about 2.5 kilos, but make sure the baby need to set up a wipe up body and head separately daily to keep the baby clean. And uh, the sick and uh, uh, babies who are admitted to the nursery, you should not bathe. And term babies, uh, following day, you can bathe the baby. So it's very important prevention of hospital acquired infection to the mother as well as the baby. So most important thing is hand washing. So I know everybody is now in this um, pandemic period, period, everybody is aware about this uh, hand washing. So make sure that you also practice that correctly. So uh, breastfeeding itself uh, prevent uh, infection because of the mother's same globulins and uh, a uh, lot of factors in the um, colostrum. So early breastfeeding, that's why we have to encourage it is actually some immunization, immunization uh, to the baby. So skin to skin contact with the mother also prevent the infection. Kangaroo mother care, I think we are going to have another uh, separate lecture. So, so uh, rem uh, removing unnecessary um, IV lines is important and uh, minimize skin friction and aseptic uh, procedures and handling of IV lines again do not uh, ever prick a baby unnecessary unnecessary and we have to cut down on the antibiotics so putting cannulas unnecessary so unless there is absolute uh, indication you should not prick these babies that is a source of infection so again the uh, you have to give some uh, advice on the danger signs to the mother so if there's any bleeding from the umbilicus, maybe from the per rectal or from the per vagina, it is uh, uh, something to concern. And if there's any jaundice early and extensive, and uh, if it is prolonged jaundice more than two weeks, and if there's a failure to pass meconium or urine within 24 to 48 hours, is something to concern. And if there's a persistent vomiting, so I mean regurgitation and uh, it's uh, something very common, but if there's a persistent vomiting, uh, you have to be uh, 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 take care of that. And poor feeding or the undue lethargy or the excessive crying, uh, you have to warn the mothers if there's any signs to inform uh, you in the postnatal world. So danger signs. So if there's any frothing at mouth or drooling of saliva and ch any choking episodes, it may be sort of a undiagnosed tracheoesophageal fistula. So um, uh, you should observe that, don't ignore. And um, respiratory difficulty, apnea, or the cyanosis, again, um, is a um, uh, danger sign. And any body temperature changes. If the baby has become hypothermic without any reason, it could be sepsis. So usually these babies do become hypothermic uh, rather than getting fever. That is a sign of sepsis. So seizures, neonatal seizures, of course, sometimes difficult to identify, but I think there's a separate lecture about it. You will uh, um, uh, get more information from that lecture. So um, any evidence of infection? Now, uh, these pictures, you can see uh, the umbilical sepsis. You can see the umbilicus um, surrounding uh, the skin. There's erythema uh, that is for about uh, point, uh, uh, if it is more than 0.5 centimeters, it is considered uh, severe infection where yeah, baby will need the intravenous antibiotics. So one or two pustules is nothing to worry, but if there's more than 10 pustules, uh, the baby uh, will need an antibiotic. And uh, this uh, uh, third is, uh, is uh, separative conjunctivitis, again, something to worry. Uh, and the other picture that is uh, shows the oral touch if the mother has been given antibiotics or the baby has been on antibiotics, this is a, uh, something you have to see with the baby having oral touch. Baby can present with the difficulty in feeding. So skin lesions, 
so one or two pastures actually nothing to worry but if it's more than 10 uh, you might have to consider giving antibiotics so now the second this picture shows the erythema toxicum but it's a very non-specific uh, rash so most mothers get worried about that but you have to reassure them that it is a non-specific rash it uh, spreads from one place to the other and usually um, automatically get uh, resolved within two to three weeks so danger signs again not feeding well and less active uh, than before and fast uh, breathing that you know about in order to see the chest syndrome in grunting temperature more than 35.5 centigrade, centigrade so less than 35.5 centigrades so more than 10 skin fastules and profiostip baby and convulsions this again so advice on discharge you have to keep the baby warm always wash your hands uh, before handling the baby and restrict visitors and uh, get uh, some uh, give some advice uh, about the danger signs and uh, I mean, discharge criteria, of course, uh, depending on the situation will change, but you have to make sure the baby is uh, well with no evidence of infection, feeding well, and mother confident of taking care of the baby. And uh, again, uh, you have to arrange a follow-up visit. So in uh, small four days, uh, 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 babies, we might have to see early to see the weight gain. So not uh, usually we ask them to come in about uh, one month time, but before that, if there's any concern uh, of these babies. So now this is very important. Now we have a perinatal database. Uh, <coughs> sorry, it is uh, when you enter the data, the causes of morbidity and mortality according to the international classification of diseases. And uh, gestation specific mortality, now we are collecting the data that is your duty to fill this uh, uh, <coughs> database. And uh, all staff categories uh, has to help in data collection and senior medical st uh, staff is responsible for that. <coughs> now, during this pandemic area, I want to tell you something about the newborn of a mother with the COVID-19, how it can be. Now, it has been shown that the rate of infection does not change with the mode of delivery. Either it is done by a normal delivery or cesarean section. Rate of infection in the baby is, uh, is the same. But that is uh, up to the <coughs> data that they have. Uh, so, experienced number uh, member of the delivery at the delivery, and um, they should wear full personal protective and routine care of the delivery should be done, that is the report clamping in the skin care and early breastfeeding. So the baby shouldn't be separated from the mother, that's rooming in is very really important when the mother is having uh, COVID-19. Mother should practice hand hygiene and wear a mask and to minimize the risk of transmission from mothers to baby. So vertical transmission rates are very low uh, and uh, even after uh, um, when the uh, the infection rates are very low. The face shield or the face mask shouldn't be placed on the baby's face. That is very important to continue breastfeeding and uh, and keep uh, the baby with the mother, not to separate unless the baby mother is critically ill in the ICU. Uh, you have to screen uh, these babies for COVID-19. Ideally, PCR should be done within 24 hours and if negative, 48 hours prior to discharge. But now, because of the resource uh, uh, limited setting, we will we are doing only one PCR within the uh, first 10 days. Thank you. Any questions? If you have any questions, you can put into the... Yeah. So there are a couple of questions I try to answer quickly. <coughs> Aha. That is actually a good question. But it's uh, uh, taken as a time of birth. Is it the time the head comes out or the whole body comes out? Now I think uh, I usually take the time where the baby take the first breath. So the baby take the first breath and start to cry because the mother also can hear the baby's crying. Okay, so the, when the uh, I mean so there is no complication. Usually when the head comes out, baby start crying. So when the head comes up, that is the time that I consider as a time of birth. Okay. <coughs> yeah, uh, now uh, the squeezing, and that is the milking of the cord, it can flow directly to the baby rather than waiting. Is it correct? Now there are, I mean, still there's a no consensus guidelines. A lot of studies has been done. Uh, 
um, milking and debate clamping. So, I mean, there's no concern uh, guideline. Some, some says it is not good to milk the, because there, we cannot control uh, it in how much blood to go when we are milking, maybe sort of uh, overloaded. So, because of that, at the moment, there is no consensus line, but the guideline says is to keep just a, uh, keep one minute and then clamp the food. Sandhya, can you tell them in detail uh, how to face a COVID-19 delivery, what precautions they should take because uh, they may have yeah. to face that? Yeah, that I told you, I mean, very... Um, yeah, very so this thing, most important thing is now, uh, as I have told you, the uh, mode of delivery does not affect the rate of infection. So now the minimizing numbers, now if you are going to the theater, minimum number should be in, uh, inside the theater, not a uh, lot of people. And the other thing, even in the labor room, it has to be, uh, again, a minimum number. In the labor rooms, so you have to keep the, all the uh, uh, I mean, windows open if possible. Uh, because they think it is if the baby get contact contaminated that is not from the secretion mainly from the mother's feces so that is important so uh, i mean again the rate of uh, infection in babies uh, are very low so you have to wear the full uh, personal protective equipment and most important thing again the routine care that is uh, delayed cord clamping and uh, uh, putting the baby onto the mother's abdomen and early breastfeeding is very very important that the routine care we have to do there's no difference and uh, even after this thing you have to take the baby and keep the baby and mother together do not separate unless there is uh, absolute contraindication and the mother is very ill in icu um, even if in the icu the mother can express this milk you can express the breast milk can uh, give it to the baby any any questions sir uh, I mean to wash the baby after normal delivery. You should not wash the um, baby after normal delivery. That's normal babies. You should keep uh, for 24 hours for a bath. I mean, don't uh, wash the baby immediately. So if the, you know the baby is full of uh, vernix, even nowadays, we should not remove all these vernix because that is, again, the natural protection to prevent hypothermia. You have just to dry the baby by a hot towel. What is the significance of noting the number of umbilical arteries? Yes, you know that uh, number of uh, umbilical arteries are associated with some anomalies. So usually the renal anomalies, if you, I mean, see a uh, um, single umbilical artery, you have to think about whether the baby's having uh, some renal anomalies inside, you might have to do a uh, ultrasound scan later and see. Yes, unless uh, it's amniotic fluid is sterile. Yes, unless the uh, membranes are ruptured, it is sterile inside. Okay, sterile free. How long we can delay? Um, what is the, not very clear the question is, okay. When to do heel prick test? That is, uh, you are talking about the neonatal screening must be, that is before discharge. Before discharge, you have to do the neonatal screening. Nowadays, we do uh, check for three tests at the moment, that is the thyroxine and the G6PD and the congenital adrenal hyperplasia. What is the sample for PCR? Is it blood or high? It is high nasal swab, not the blood, okay? No, that is not actually the midwife, so the nurses has to do the labeling of the babies. But you have to supervise and make sure it's uh, been done correctly. Yeah, that is again the nasal uh, song. Uh, how many years is considered as adequate spacing? That of course you have to ask from the obstetricians, sorry. Do we need to hang the baby on foot by our hands after? No, no, that's not uh, been done. So you can keep the baby at the same level at the placenta until you do the cord uh, uh, clamping. If the mother has COVID and baby no COVID, should we separate the baby and mother? Uh, 
No, no, that's why I'm telling you, if the mother is COVID positive, so always keep the baby with the uh, mother. Do not separate. Why are we giving uh, vitamin A mega dose before discharge? That is to the mother. Can you please ask from uh, that question from the obstetricians? I do not have uh, any idea about it. Uh, can COVID-19 spread to baby? We are breastfeeding. No, I mean, uh, they have uh, I mean, uh, identified some MRA, MRA particles in the breast milk, but uh, uh, it uh, definitely not uh, spread by uh, breast milk, by breast milk. Uh, when do we, uh, yes, uh, do we do, yeah, finish? Do screening for TSH, G6, PDCH for each new, yes, yes, before discharging you in the preterm babies, you go before discharging from the baby room, you have to do it's a must, okay, this neonatal screening. It's a great achievement actually that we have to uh, do in each and every baby. Thank you then. The, so I think your next lecture will be done by uh, Dr. Srila Di Silva. That is a new yeah, I think Sandhya, before we conclude, I will tell them that uh, their personal protective is very important when they handle COVID-19. Uh, so the personal protective equipments are, uh, basically you need to wear a mask, uh, surgical mask or N95 mask. And uh, if you can have face shield, that's so much the better. Uh, and also the uh, hand washing and gloves and the, the apron. So uh, these are very important when you handle a delivery uh, because you are the most important person in the labor room uh, when you handle a COVID-19 patient because you shouldn't carry the infection from patient to you uh, and to your friends or to your family and to the community. So it's important that you wear the personal protective equipment uh, uh, well, and 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 then uh, you should know how to remove the personal protective equipment at the end of the session, at the end of the job, because uh, there are chances that you can get contaminated if you um, if you violate these basic basic principles. Uh, uh, Sandhya, you want to expand on that? Yes, I agree with you, Sri Lal. Now, uh, I think personal protective equipment are now freely available in our hospital, of course. I think uh, we have to train them how to do it and drop in before starting the internship. I think uh, it's a... Uh, yeah, that will be done, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you, Sandhya. Okay, uh, so the next uh, lecture is on uh, a neonatal, examin neonatal examination at birth. Uh, in fact, the neonatologist at uh, Kalambu North Teaching Hospital is supposed to do that, but he's uh, down with COVID, so I had to do this. Now, uh, this is the standard treatment protocols uh, available in the College of Pediatrician website. Uh, so what do you mean by neonatal examination at birth? When you go for a delivery, uh, you have you basically go for a delivery for resuscitation, uh, and also at the same time uh, you have to examine the baby as well. Uh, so what do you want to examine at the baby at birth? Uh, you have to find out the uh, you, in, I mean, before you go probably you need to find out whether the baby ha mother has been given tetanus toxoid and uh, syphilis screening done, HIV screening done and uh, any kind of infection during pregnancy and whether there is any polyhydramnus or oligohydramnus. So these are important when you do neonatal examination. We'll come to that why it is important. Then uh, uh, the first impression is the condition at birth, isn't it? Whether the baby is crying or whether the baby is not crying. 
and whether the baby needs resuscitation or whether the baby can be left alone. So this is important. Right. The second thing is a uh, baby uh, who needs resuscitation uh, need to follow the uh, need to follow the resuscitation steps that will be dealt in a separate lecture. The other important thing that you need to notice in the newborn examination at birth is uh, whether the baby has an excessive drooling, because some of the babies, they have excessive drooling at birth. Uh, why do you think that they do have excessive drooling at birth? Why it is important? What you are trying to identify? You are trying to identify tough. What is tough? Can you put your chat box? What is tough? What is tough? You basically, that is the first sign that you are going to pick up, uh, pick up uh, tough. So it's important that you identify uh, tracheus, tracheosugal fistula. So that is uh, tracheosugal fistula. You, you, the first sign is excessive drooling. If the baby has excessive drooling, then uh, what do you want to do? So if you notice that baby is having an excessive drooling, uh, what, uh, as a house officer, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? No, you don't have to call anesthetist. anesthetist. Yeah, so the, 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 you have to suck out the secretion and insert an NG tube. So insert an NG tube and find out whether the NG tube is actually going to the stomach. So you can actually take an X-ray as later on, but in the labor room or in the theater, you pass the NG tube and see whether you can hear the gas in the stomach. Because uh, the, in tracheal fistula, there are several types of tracheal fistula. So if it is a blind pouch, you might not hear the air in the tummy. So therefore, it's important that you check the air. And in those patients, those babies, uh, what, what are the precautions that you need to take? You can put in chat box. What precautions would you need to take? Now you have suspected tracheal fistula, um, and you didn't hear any uh, air sound in the, in the stomach. Um, then you put NG tube and try to uh, send some air through a syringe. So what do you want? What is the next tip you want to do? What precautions would you like to take? Yeah, stop breastfeeding, avoid breastfeeding, because uh, we don't want baby to aspirate and keep nearby mouth. Keep nearby mouth. And then uh, these babies, uh, as somebody said earlier in the chat box, uh, need that x-ray and to confirm whether there is a tracheal fistula. So make sure that, so that is important. So that is something that you need to, you need to uh, pick up. Then uh, uh, next thing is that probably, probably as Dr. Sandhya Bandar said, you had to put the baby onto the mother for the skin to skin contact. This helps in number of beds, as she said, uh, like uh, ten, normalize the temperature, prevent the baby getting hypothermia, and also prevent the uh, uh, and, uh, encourage the maternal colonization of the baby. Then another important thing is identify the baby uh, who are uh, babies who are handling well. What do you mean by who are handling well? And we say this baby handles well or this baby handles poorly. What do you mean by that? How do you judge at birth? What do you mean by handling? Yeah, what is? Uh, only one person has answered hypotonia. Yes. Anything else? Anything else? Okay, Abga. Abga comes under resuscitation. Yeah. Uh, so handling means when you actually handle the baby, whether the baby is crying well, 
whether the baby's color is good, whether the baby's tone is good. That is the most important. Whether the baby's tone is a normal tone, or whether the baby's hypotonic, 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 uh, and then whether the color is, uh, as I said, color is normal, and uh, and temperature is normal. So these. These things, I uh, these things will tell you. This is babies whether the baby is handling well or not. So if the baby is handling poorly, and uh, uh, handling poorly, then I think uh, you have to take very seriously. If you don't do anything, the baby will deteriorate. Uh, it's not dysmorphism to look for dysmorphism. It's only the baby's tone, baby's crying, baby's color, whether these things are normal or not. Right, then you need to look for the major signs of congenital anomalies at birth. So what are the congenital anomalies that you are going to look for at birth? You have already told that you need to look for drooling, excessive drooling, excessive drooling means tracheostomical fistula. What are other uh, congenital anomalies that you can pick up at birth? I think Dr. Sandhya Bandar mentioned uh, that somebody asked umbilical arteries, the arteries and the veins. So more than one artery, there, there, there's a vein and two arteries normally. So if there's a single umbilical artery, and then uh, it is associated with congenital anomaly. So you have to put it down. So always when you serve the umbilical cord, when you cut the umbilical cord, then it is important to check, uh, important to check the number of the umbilical arteries and the vein so that you hit put it down on the nodes that uh, this baby has uh, two umbilical arteries and one vein. Then as uh, uh, somebody said, that it's important to look for cleft palate and hair lip. Now hair lip is very obvious. When the baby is born, you can see where there's a hair lip and whether it's minor, uh, minor or major hair lips, bilateral or unilateral. The cleft palate is very hard to see. Sometimes it goes unnoticed. Therefore, it's important that when the baby is crying, you have to look very hard at the posterior palate and see whether the posterior palate is intact. So if the posterior palate, if there's a cleft in the posterior palate, then you have to note it down because it, depending on the uh, degree of the cleft in the palate, uh, you have to convey that message to your senior house officers, uh, nurses, and the midwives, and the consultants so that the the we they take uh, precautions to prevent regurgitation of the meal. So it's important that you identify this is this is something that we very often as uh, doctors we tend to miss the cleft palate because uh, there's no hair lip in some baby there's no hair lip or cleft lip it's only the palate and the palate sometimes maybe a full palate cleft or maybe the posterior palate. Cleft. So it's important to identify the posterior palate cleft because there's a chance that the baby will regurgitate and uh, baby can uh, develop apnea after regurgitation. So therefore, <coughs> looking for palate is important. Then at birth, the other things that you normally look for is baby's eyes, baby's ears are normal. Their ears, um, very often you have to look for periauricular tags. Uh, uh, preauricular tags or postauricular tags. The, if there are tags, again, they are associated with congenital abnormalities. Whether the baby's spine is normal, whether the baby's limbs are normal, upper limbs and lower limbs are normal, whether number of fingers, then this is very important. So you need to, as a house officer, you need to count the number of fingers, say one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, both upper limbs, and then both lower limbs, one, two, three, four, five, one, because sometimes we miss extra digit, and sometimes we miss the syndactyly or syndactyly whether the, 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 some, the fingers may be fused, and uh, maybe not fingers may not be developed properly. Uh, and also the other important uh, thing is uh, to look for scalp chilling, especially after normal delivery. Uh, normal delivery. What are the scalp uh, swellings that you that, that you notice in a baby? Yeah, kephal hematoma, isn't it? Kephal hematoma or caput. So if the baby comes through the vagina in the general uh, canal. 
uh, uh, subjected to some degree of pressure, <coughs> then you have to uh, look for kephal hematomas and caput. Uh, can anybody tell me uh, what is the most serious uh, uh, swelling that you get in the scalp which can threaten the baby's life? Yeah, good. Uh, Subglial hemorrhage. So uh, this uh, can cause, uh, this can lead to shock in the baby. And then baby, so baby needs uh, resuscitation. So these babies will become pale uh, after a few minutes and, uh, and, and develop, uh, develop shock. So therefore, this baby, you need to notice, uh, you need to pick up these babies. It's not very common, but it happens from time to time. So you have to have an open mind and and detect the the uh, detect this hemorrhage. This is life threatening type of hemorrhage. Uh, and the other important thing is to look for anal and urethral complications. What do you mean by anal and urethral? Sometimes the babies doesn't have a anus. Baby are babies are born without an anus. What do you call that condition? You can put in the chat box. Uh, is Hirschsprung is a um, lower is anal atresia or we call it uh, imperfect anus. The correct word is imperfect anus. So if the baby has an imperfect anus, then you what do you want to do? The baby has imperfect anus. What do you want to do? How do you how do you? Yeah, you have to confirm that it is high anal atresia or low in latricia. So you probably need to get the X-ray done. It's not very urgent, uh, but you have to inform the senior officers, and inform the nurses and midwives, and arrange for an X-ray and to find out whether this is a high in latricia or low in latricia. And also you have to refer these babies to the uh, pediatric surgical department. And don't feed because this, again, the, the feeds are not going to be tolerated in these babies. And also when you take x-rays, that's a specific uh, posture that we need to maintain. You have to get, get the limbs uh, up and then get the x-rays. Right. Um, then, uh, uh, yeah, with vectoral and the ve there are other congenital anomalies like vectoral anomalies that we need to look for if there is a ABM imperfect anus, you should know what vectoral anomalies you are going to detail. Then other thing is any urethral abnormalities. What are urethral abnormalities that you are going to look for in a newborn baby at birth? What are the urethral abnormalities? Yeah, hyperspadiasis. So hyperspadiasis, you should know what hyperspadiasis is. So can be hyperspadiasis. The the prepuce may be short, and the the shaft of the 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 penis may be an, uh, curved uh, because of the. Uh, so therefore, it's important that you. Uh, again, I will join my police who meeting again. Once who meeting again, I will join you on that. Hyperspadiasis is uh, something that you need to look for. Uh, anything else that is important in the baby at birth? Uh, genitals? Testis, very good. Testis. The testis is important. So don't miss absent testis at birth. So uh, sometimes the testis may be undescended at birth. So please, please don't miss this because this is very important. If this goes unnoticed, uh, even at discharge, the uh, baby might come one day with testicular torsion and you will have to remove the testis. So therefore, don't miss the don't miss this testis. Therefore, it's important that you examine the baby's testis and make sure both testis are there on in the scrotum. And if that is not so, then it's a very serious thing that you need to note it down on your discharge plan. You have to tell the parents. And then uh, you need to uh, uh, inform that to the, your seniors. And yes, other important thing is other important thing, ambiguous genitalia. Again, this is important. Why do you think ambiguous genitalia is important? 
Yeah, it's a congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So general, again, congenital adrenal hyperplasia can be uh, can lead to uh, serious complications, can lead to shock. Babies can present a shock. So how do you identify this, this uh, the uh, suggestion of congenital adrenal hyperplasia? By looking at the color of the test, the color of the genitalia. If there's a dark color, then it's probably suggestive of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So these, so as you can see, there are a lot of new, new, lot of information that you can actually look uh, at birth and then uh, see whether the, this baby is normal or whether this baby needs something, uh, needs some advice or intervention. Now, uh, by discharge, uh, as a doctor and as a nurse uh, in the medic, in the neonatal unit or postnatal unit. You need to, as a doctor, you need to check for heart sounds. So it's heart sounds, check heart sounds on both sides. Again, this is another important then thing that you probably can do at birth. Always make a habit to listen the heart sounds on both sides of the chest. Why do you want to do that? What are you trying to detect, pick up? By looking at, by listening to the heart sounds on both sides. Uh, not dextrocardia. Dextrocardia is an innocent thing. Dextrocardia can be dextrocardia, but what is important for the management point of view? So if you, suppose if you don't listen, uh, the heart sounds on the left side of the chest, and you hear the heart sounds on the right side of the chest, it's diaphragmatic hernia. The possibilities are congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So again, that is another serious thing. So as house officer, if you pick up that, that's a great thing, because you have to you have to inform to the PD, you have to inform to your consultants, senior house officers, nurses, and then try to exclude the congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Then um, other important thing is uh, uh, we we tend to do uh, uh, we tend to do saturation test, pulse oximetry set test before discharge and we tend to check saturation on all four limbs now all four limbs uh, to make sure the saturations are normal if there's a discrepancy in the saturation then that is uh, means the baby is having a possibility of a, a cyanotic congenital heart disease and needs uh, early referral and um, uh, the, the investigations so don't miss fibrillar pulse this is another important thing this is something that you shouldn't miss as a house officer. So check the femoral pulse on both sides, uh, uh, or even one side is okay, but as long as you can get the pulse. So if there's no pulse, I think you have to check the radial pulse uh, or brachial pulse and see. And uh, if you can feel both, see whether there's a difference between the brachial pulse and the radial pulse. What are you going to achieve? What are you going to pick up by looking at this? Checking femoral pulse. Coactation, yes, coactation, coactation aviata. So uh, there are some babies who have been discharged from home, discharged from hospital and come with shock. And uh, when you go through the notes, you find that the house officer or the postnatal doctor has not detected uh, the femoral pulse. So don't do that mistake. Always detect, always try to feel for femoral pulse. And then if it is not there, and try to get the senior to have another look and see whether the baby is having coactations. So babies with severe coactation can come with a cardiogenic shock in the first uh, few weeks, in the first uh, 10 days or first two weeks uh, to hospital again. So which means uh, you, if you detect, if you miss coactation, uh, femoral pulse, then you will miss the coactation. So it's important abs to detect absent femoral pulse or radiant femoral delay. Okay, so uh, so that should be done by AMO. So you can see, now this is the uh, standard treatment protocol available in the net. So this gives an idea and what to be done, uh, uh, what to be done. Yes, now the one question is when measuring saturation, it is important to check the saturation on the right hand. Why? 
because uh, the left hand, uh, sometimes because of the coarctation, like there's a duct dependent circulation, the le left side may be a bit low. So therefore always try to detect, when you do resuscitation, we always try to check the saturation of the right hand of the saturation that will come during later on. Um, okay, uh, other thing is, can we detect the type of TO TOF? Yes, um, by inserting and no, but not by hearing. But uh, when you sort of insert the NG tube and take X-ray, you can actually pick up uh, pick up the degree of the top. Okay, I think uh, that's all about the newborn examination. Uh, so it's important that to, when you do newborn examination, you have to keep your hands warm and prevent the baby getting hypothermic because this is a time that baby will get hypothermic. And very often you will find that when you send the babies to the uh, postnatal ward, and check the temperature, the temperature is hypothermic, that babies get bad. So therefore, babies get worse. Therefore, it's important that you keep, maintain the temperature and maintain the, uh, I mean, we can actually use a um, uh, overhead uh, heater or keep the baby warm, as Dr. Sandhya Bandara said, keep the baby warm with the hats, the stockings and clothes. Uh, so uh, tough, management is different for the time being you stop feeding and then you may have to put up a drip to prevent the baby is getting high so don't worry about the diaphragmatic cranial management but it's important in the newborn examination how to pick up abnormal baby the the signs that will tell you that there is a congenital anomaly of the baby okay i think that's all it's 9 15 now uh, so there were few questions in the chat box which I answered. So always uh, go to this site and then look at the uh, uh, look at these guidelines uh, that will be helpful for your uh, for your clinical work. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so do, don't uh, this is not a time to discuss the in detail uh, what to expect in the x-rays but if you just order an x-ray then that's enough. Uh, it's a separate lecture on newborn surgical issues. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Rajita, we will uh, move on to the next lecture. Rajita, who's... Right, okay, now Nimesha. So Nimesha is Gamima. Uh, she's a neonatologist. Uh, she's at Colombo South Teaching Hospital. And uh, she's going to talk to you on uh, HI and neonatal conversions. Okay, so over to Nimesha then. Thank you very much, sir. So good morning, doctors. Uh, so during the next 30 minutes, we'll be discussing about uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in neonate and also about neonatal convulsions. So let's try to go through um, uh, what is known as HIE and the causes of it, uh, what are the complications and how we could manage it. And then we'll move towards uh, discussing about neonatal convulsions. Again, we'll go through the causes, complications, management, um, and how to identify a baby who is seizing, right? Okay, now our first objective coming into uh, HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Now, when we come to a definition, of course, we need to know a definition about a condition whenever we are studying about it. But for this, unfortunately, we haven't got a universe definition. But at your stage, just remember, so as the name implies, there is hypoxia, there is ischemia, right? So hypoxia means lack of oxygen into the brain tissues. Ischemia is lack of blood supply to the brain tissues. So that is a combination of hypoxia and ischemia. So as the name implies, this is characterized by hypoxia, acidosis, and if severe, can result in significant organ damage, not only in the brain, but also in the rest of the body. As the patho as the patho as due to the pathophysiology, not only the brain matter, but also the other organs are also undergoing hypoxia and ischemia. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we will be able to identify these patients at birth. So we all know that we go through the APCA scoring. 
I'm sure you will go through APCA scoring and neonatal resuscitation in detail during the course of the day. So I'm not going um, uh, to discuss about this right now, but just remember for the time being, this is how we assess the babies, yeah? Okay, uh, so let's discuss about the causes of uh, perinatal hypoxia or causes leading to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So usually uh, what happens is in an acute situation, there is an acute abruption of the blood supply from the mother to the baby. So there is an abruption at the blood supply at the level of the uterus, uterine artery, uterus, or the placenta. Okay? So what are the conditions that could predispose this? So abrupt your placenta. What happens there? All of a sudden, the placenta separates from the uterus. So the blood supply is halted there. Yeah? So severe PIH mothers, again, what happens is problem related to uterine blood supply and also the placental vasculature and the blood supply to the baby. What happens in cord collapse? When the cord comes out of the maternal uh, genital tract, what happens is due to the coldness out in the environment, all of a sudden the cord, the vessels in the cord undergo, undergoes uh, a spasm. So the blood supply to the fetus is compromised. Cord around the neck. So I don't need to explain there. So cord around the neck. So you are going to obstruct the uh, airway of the baby and baby will get hypoxic. Birth trauma, like Sir mentioned. So this a significant thing is your subgallial hemorrhage. Yeah? And sometimes you get significant nerve injuries. All these can lead to severe uh, hypoxia and ischemia. Sometimes in uterus sepsis, like for example, a mother who is significantly, a mother who is having chorioamnionitis and the baby in utero has got the infection, early onset neonatal sepsis. So these babies due to sepsis itself, when they are born, they can appear quite depressed at birth. And there are certain conditions where mom herself is at a shock status. Let's assume, for example, a mother having significant septic shock. Or oh, these days, we know COVID mothers coming with a lot of complications. Yeah, Mother coming with a significant bleed. So all these conditions can lead to a maternal shock. And if the maternal blood pressure drops drastically, then there's no way that the fetus is going to get a good amount of blood from the mother. So with that, the baby uh, will get a significant hypoxia and ischemia. So these are some of the common uh, some of the common conditions leading to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy of the neonate. So what are the early complications? So this is why it's important for us to recognize babies who are having HIE and then subsequently arrange proper management yeah, because of all these complications. So as I told you before, this is because of the generalized hypoxemia, generalized ischemia of the whole body. You can see that everything is due to this hypoxia. Now let's go through those. So what happens with the heart? Although, although the newborn heart is structurally normal because of the myocardial depression due to the hypoxia, babies can have hypotension, yeah? low blood pressure. And kidneys, similarly, hypoxia, ischemia, and that leads to acute tubular necrosis. So the patients will have renal failure, which is acute. Metabolic-wise, this is a huge stress for the baby. So the baby can have hyperglycemia. At the same time, because of the uh, uh, problems related to the glycemic control, they can have significant hypoglycemia as well. So there is a component of SIADH running in the background. So these babies are more prone to develop hyponatremia. Hematologically, again, the bone marrow is depressed, leading to low platelets. This can also lead into coagulopathy due to liver dysfunction. Gut-wise, again, blood supply to the gut is compromised. So you can get bowel necrosis, hepatic injury leading to high ASTs, ALTs, and also leading to coagulopathy. 
central nervous system bias, you will see a quite depressed baby with high hypotonic, who is not sucking, and commonly these babies can have seizures, and also sometimes they can have uh, intracerebral bleeding. Okay. So, HIE babies, they appear quite depressed at birth. Uh, they don't cry. Their tone is poor. They don't have uh, their uh, routine primitive reflexes that we are supposed to see in a neonate. Yeah. So when you see such a baby at birth, what are the things that you need to do? Three specific interventions. First thing is, you have to make sure that you provide appropriate resuscitation of the baby. That we will discuss later during the course of the day. Then, the specific management for hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is therapeutic hypothermia, that is total body cooling. Then, you need to provide supportive therapy for the baby because all the body organ systems are compromised. Right. Now, there are indications for cooling, that is total body cooling. So this is how a baby is undergoing cooling. You can see that this baby is nicely uh, lying on the cot or uh, uh, under the sister or an incubator. And then the, two, the whole body is covered with this vest, which is uh, cooling the baby's body. And you can see something applied over the limbs and also over the head. So that is providing uh, the low temperature for the baby. Now, there are a lot of indications, a lot of criteria that you have to consider whether a baby should undergo cooling, which is too much for you. What you need to know is when a baby is depressed at birth, that you need to understand that this is a baby who might need cooling, right? So how do you recognize these babies? So as I told you before, it's very important in any baby who undergoes resuscitation, after the resuscitation, you have to stop and ask yourself and ask your seniors, is this baby a suitable candidate for cooling? So that's all you need to do from your point of view. After that, you, the, your seniors can go through the criteria and can decide whether this baby needs cooling or not, okay? So if the baby needs cooling, that baby will be transferred to the neonatal ICU. What if the, criteria, what if the baby doesn't meet criteria for cooling? Then you have a major job there. So at the very first instance, even if your team decides that this baby doesn't need cooling, but it is likely that this baby might develop some features of neurological depression later on. So this period is usually the first six hours. So during the first six hours as the house officer, you have an obligation to go through the neurological status of the baby quite frequently. Every one to two hourly, you have to assess the neurology of the baby. So what are you going to assess? You need to assess the tone of the baby, whether that baby is hypertonic or hypotonic. How about the primitive reflexes of the baby? Put your finger into the mouth and see whether the baby can do sucking. Whether the baby can do grasping reflex and whether you can elicit a nice morose reflex in the baby. If those things are not there, then it's highly likely that this baby is compromised neurologically and might even need cooling later on. How is the alertness of the baby? Is the baby very sleepy or is the baby very active and irritable? Yeah, all these things indicate that the baby's sensorium is depressed and whether the baby gets seizures. So if any of these becomes abnormal, please get this baby relieved by the senior and then uh, discuss with them as to whether this baby needs cooling. So that's all that you need to do uh, as far as the house of it is concerned. So remember, it's a recognition that this baby is having neurological depression due to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. That's what you need to do as a house officer. Okay, 
Once you have recognized, and then you need to transfer the baby into the newborn intensive care, and the rest will be done there. Okay, so this is a picture of a crop, croppy infant that you can see the baby is like a ragged doll. When you hold the baby prone, a baby with a nice stone must be able to keep the head and the uh, body in the same line, but in this baby, it's just flops, right? So a floppy baby. So the post resuscitation management, this is far beyond your scope because this will be done in the neonatal intensive care unit. But if you have to talk to the mother, which you must do, these are the things that you can keep in your mind. So at least you can tell the mother, these are the things that we are going to do with your baby. So we'll, in a baby who needs cooling or in a baby who has any other complications related to ischemic encephalopathy, we will admit the baby to this kubu and then we will monitor the baby. And then we will give fluids for the baby, usually restricted, we will monitor the baby. All these things are done keeping in mind the complications that this baby can have. Remember the complications that we discussed before. Generally, we start babies on antibiotics. They are intense or need some form of analgesia. Then we are carefully observing the baby for fits. If there are fits, we are going to give anticonvulsants. And if there are a bleeding tendency, we might have to give FFPs. If the baby is anemic, then you have to give blood transfusions, frequent blood gases, one common abnormality we see in these babies are metabolic acidosis due to hypoxia and ischemia. So sometimes these babies have respiratory distress, needing ventilation. Yeah, and as, as I told you before, they can have hypotension, needing some inotropes, renal failure, and all these complications. We'll keep an eye out and then we'll manage as necessary. Right. So on this chart, again, this point onwards, your active management comes into play. So you will need to arrange regular clinic follow-up. So when you do the discharge card, make sure you arrange regular clinic follow-up for these type of babies because they are more prone to develop a lot of complications later on. What are these complications? They, they are at high risk of developing developmental delay, cerebral palsy, and then hearing problems, visual effects, and then later on epilepsy. So what are the things you need to arrange at follow-up? You need to get a date for a repeat uh, uh, a clinic, clinic visit, and then you have to make sure that eye, uh, eye assessment is arranged, hearing assessment is arranged, yeah? And also make sure that you document in the discharge chart the discharge weight and the OFC. Those things are very important for monitoring purposes later on in the clinic. Okay? And then we need to arrange multidisciplinary follow-up for these type of babies where you can provide physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy at the same time. right? And also in these multidisciplinary clinics, they will frequently monitor the baby's development and even before they can detect any abnormality, they will uh, start some uh, uh, procedures and interventions to improve the posture uh, and improve the movements of the baby. So it's very important that you discuss with your seniors and identify the best multidisciplinary team where you can refer the baby to. Okay? So I know in Lady Ritual Hospital we have one, in Kalubovila we have one. Um, Ragam also similarly. So likewise, you have to identify from your unit where you can refer these babies and then arrange that follow-up, definitely. So that's your, uh, that's your duty. Yeah. So these are some photographs of babies who have spastic diplegia. And you can see in this picture, there's a significant mic microcephaly. So that's why documenting your OFC in the discharge card is very important. If you have any questions, uh, just put in the chat. Yeah. So uh, how do we decide whether baby should uh, be resuscitated or uh, need cooling? Yeah. Uh, so you assess uh, at birth the CTDH, so that is color, tone, whether the baby is breathing, uh, and then the heart rate of the baby. If the baby is fluffy, 
If the baby is having a poor tone, not bleeding, and heart rate less than 100, if any of those abnormal parameters, then you need to start resuscitation. That those details will be discussed with you in the afternoon, right? And then cooling. For cooling, there are a lot of criteria that we apply for cooling. So we assess whether there is an ischemic component, right? So with that, we take into consideration uh, the pH of a blood gas, uh, then the APGAS group, and whether you need that prolonged resuscitation. And then there's another set of criteria we are we assess the neurological parameters of the baby. But I told you before, that is the tone, alertness, and the primitive reflexes and seizures. So we take a combination of these uh, characteristics to decide whether a baby needs cooling or not. So that's why I told, told you that this is beyond your scope. Uh, so what you need to do is you need to identify a potential baby who might need cooling and then we need to uh, get the attention of your seniors and discuss with them uh, as to whether this baby must be transferred to the SCBU for cooling or not, right? So this decision to cool must come from seniors, right? Not at house of the level. Okay. Uh, let me see whether there are the questions now. I hope that's clear. If that is not, please put uh, a message in the chat box. Um, so moving on to neonatal conversions. Now, this topic is very important because you as a house officer can do a lot of things when it comes to conversions from identifying the conversion into uh, providing initial care for the baby. Yeah? Uh, so there are several types of conversions. What you need to know is that neonatal conversions are quite different from what you see uh, in a large way, in, a, uh, in, a, in an infant, or for that matter, what you see in a child. Generally, in a child, what you see are generalized tonic clonic conversions. But in a neonate, uh, the, due to the immaturity of the brain, they can't produce uh, generalized tonic clonic conversions. So they have different type of conversions. So the commonest type is a subtle seizure. They are, you see, just subtle features. You wouldn't even imagine that this is a feature if you didn't know about it. Okay. And then there are tonic features uh, where you get a, a sudden contraction of one limb. Um, and then clonic means you get repetitive contractions. And this could be focal usually, that is meaning only one side of the body or one limb of the body is affected. Myoclonic jerks are very brief jerks. We'll go through a video to understand all this. And sometimes they just appear as apnea. OK, I'll come to the questions later. Um, so let me show you a video so that you can understand what a seizure is uh, and what the seizure types are, right? Oh, yeah, before that, before that, uh, yeah, so there are some non seizure events also which simulate seizures. These include sleep myoclonus and jitteriness. So, as a house officer, you can recognize, you can differentiate a seizure from non seizure. So, how do you do that? If a baby is having abnormal movements, just hold that arm, just hold that leg, and see what happens. If you can stop that movement, by you holding that limb, that is not a seizure. And also observe the baby during that time. If the baby appears quite alert, then it's highly unlikely. Again, if the baby is attached to a monitor, just observe the monitor. If the baby is having any changes in the heart rate or any changes in the saturation, if the baby stops breathing, so these are autonomic features. So if any of these happens, uh, with regards to the heart rate, saturation, or the breathing, then it's highly likely that it's a seizure and not a non-seizure event. Yeah. Uh, so sleep myoclonus is a specific entity that you see in small babies, including neonates. So as the name implies, that occurs in occurs during sleep. So there are small jerks, repetitive jerks occurring in the limbs when the baby is uh, in sleep. So if you awaken, awaken the baby, that will disappear. So you don't have to do anything for this type of sleep myoclonus. Okay, now let's go through a, a video.
Yes, it does. Sometimes it's very difficult to bring up these. Ah, oh. that is me. Can you see the video now? No. Can you see the video? Can you see the video? I have to play, right? Eh? Yeah, I'll play. Can see now. You can see that this baby is having some lip movements as if a baby is suckling, right? Hello? Oh. All right. All right. Yeah. And the eye is blinking of the eyes here, right? Very abnormal pattern of blinking of eyes. Again, a subtle seizure that you can see there. Yeah, again, lip smacking in this baby. Like chewing movements. So these are very important subtle seizures that you need to recognize as a house officer. Yeah. Yeah. Now note that this baby is having some abnormal movements of the uh, upper limbs and also lower limbs as if the baby is cycling, yeah? So that is also a subtle seizure. So as I told you before, there are some autonomic phenomena like tachycardia, bradycardia, desaturation, or apneic episodes. So these are chronic, you can see that repetitively the baby is moving the hand, yeah? So that occurs quite rhythmically. So this is a <coughs> chronic seizure and as it's occurring only in this arm, you call it a focal chronic seizure. Now look at this baby. Yeah. So you can see the limbs are uh, having, the baby is having jerks in the limbs and then also uh, in the hands. They are not occurring simultaneously. It's just the arm, you know, uh, having jerks at one time and then limbs having one time. So they can involve several body parts, right? At the same time. Sometimes you see that the baby is just looking at one side of the one side without even moving the eye. So that is also one form of a seizure. Sometimes there is just deviation of the head to one side. Okay. All right. So we will stop there and then we'll go back to our presentation. So it's very important that you recognize uh, this type of seizures. Uh, then only you can get the senior assistance and start appropriate management. And at the same time, remember, if a mom is concerned about a baby, it's highly likely that the baby is having some abnormality. So please remember, just don't disregard that this mother is talking nonsense and having some, you know, uh, postpartum blues or anything like that. So please, please pay attention, do a proper assessment and inform your seniors. Okay? Right. Now, let's go through the courses quickly. We only have five minutes left. So, again, the major course, one of the major courses is your hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. 
so sometimes there are these infections like meningitis, TTT, BS, gram negative sepsis can have it. So encephalitis wise, it's commonly uh, the herpes simplex virus that can cause encephalitis in neonates. Again, babies can have seizures. So a lot of metabolic causes like a hypoglycemia, you know, babies born to diabetic mothers can become hypoglycemic quite soon. Um, and then these babies can just present with seizures if you don't monitor the sugar levels. Sometimes if the baby is having hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, again, they can have seizures. Certain types of intracerebral hemorrhages, and also some babies are born with cerebral malformations. Okay, so these babies are anyway uh, more prone to develop seizures, even from the uh, neonatal period itself. Right. So management-wise, what you need to do is what you need to understand is the initial bit of management, and remember that you have to always call your seniors as soon as possible. So if a neonate is there who needs seizure treatment. So how do you recognize, how do you understand whether the baby needs treatment for seizures? So you know that in, even in pediatric patients, you wait for at least five minutes before you give anti-epileptic medications uh, to those pediatric patients. Likewise, in neonates also, just because there is a subtle, you know, very transient seizure, you don't have to jump and give anti-epileptic medications. So generally, if a seizure is prolonged, meaning if it goes beyond three minutes, or if that is repetitive, meaning you get more than three uh, in a given 20 minute period, then you have to decide you have to treat this baby, okay? So you initially attend to the airway breathing and circulation, the quick IV access, and then the important investigation is to do a blood sugar, uh, a capillary blood sugar, because that is the commonest cause for the seizure in a baby. If the sugar is less than 45, then you immediately give a dextrose bolus to 3 ml per kg, and you have to start the continuous infusion afterwards. So if the seizure settles, if a hypoglycemic seizure settles, settles after correcting the hypoglycemia, then you don't need to do anything for that. You can just monitor the hypoglycemia after that. But if, this, if it doesn't, or even if it persists after correcting the uh, glycemic level, then you have to send all the investigations for the previous uh, uh, courses that we discussed, and then you need to start uh, uh, anti-epileptic medications. Now, the first line anti-epileptic medication is the phenobarbital. You give it at a 20 milligram per kg, but remember it should be over 20 minutes. You can't just give it as a push bolus, right? If you do that, what will happen is the baby will invariably develop apnea, okay? Uh, and when you are giving phenobarbital for a baby, make sure you are ready with your AMBU bag. Ready, be ready with oxygen. Because at any point, these babies can stop breathing. So you have to be careful. If you see that the baby stops breathing, start AMBU ventilation. These babies will recover. Yeah. So if the seizure persists, then you have to repeat these phenobarbital doses. But remember, again, these doses are given quite slowly. Remember, be ready with the AMBU, yeah? So there are some second line medications that you can treat with like levetiracetam and phenytoin, but I'm sure you will have support from the seniors at this point. Like that, tough complications, including later on brain damage and epilepsy. So again, arranging follow-up is quite important. So if I am to summarize, what I need to tell you as the budding doctors is, Please, please recognize babies who are needing cooling, who are having seizures. Don't disregard maternal concerns, okay? Right, going through the questions. Uh, do, 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 we, do we resuscitate the baby before? Of course you have to, because even if the baby appears um, quite depressed at birth, most of these babies, they recover after resuscitation, right? So you don't have to cool all these babies. So, uh, Resuscitation should be the first step of management uh, for a depressed baby. So rationale behind cooling is just to, uh, just to prevent uh, an additional damage happening for the baby. With cooling, what you do is you reduce the body temperature, reduce the uh, metabolism of the brain so that uh, the additional, uh, the secondary damage to the brain does not happen. Uh, and then the next question is, what is jitteriness? So it's like that, um, uh, it's just the babies are quite shaky, you know, um, 
they are just uh, shaking like movements of the limbs, of the extremities of the limbs. Like your hands and legs, they can just shake. And if you hold it, they just go away, right? So that's your jitteriness. Uh, newborns while sleeping do limb movements, don't they? So how we can differentiate? Yeah, so I have uh, discussed about this. I discussed about this. Yeah. Right. Okay, uh, so as we have uh, answered all these questions, uh, we will stop our lecture now. And then you will have a 10 minute break after this before the next lecture starts. Excuse me, uh, Sham Basnaka, Madam Gilicha, Kalamati, then I give up. All right, okay. 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 So you'll have a lecture now. Uh, Sham Basnaka, Madam, will discuss with you about uh, another important topic. Uh, and after that, you will have your tea break. Okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 